thank you for coming. Um, this morning we're going to talk about, or afternoon or evening, we're going to talk about um, five ways to impress with Google Earth and Maps. Um, we're going to show how FME um, supports many different systems, of course, but this morning we're focusing on um, Google Earth and Google Maps. Okay, let's get going here. There we go. So just a quick look at the agenda. We're going to a quick intro introduction to the uh, the presenters this morning, and then we have um, several demos. And we're very excited to uh, this morning to have um, um, James Cap and um, who's the other fellow? Remember Jesse Romo. Jesse Romo, thank you for uh, on the Kansas Airspace uh, Awareness. So we're, that's a that's a system that's actually been deployed using some of the techniques that you're going to yeah. see this morning. Very okay. Cool. So here, here are the. Oh, I should have gone to the next slide. Then my, go. my lack of memory would have. Uh, so, so Aaron Koning is going to be the main, um, the main presenter from Safe this morning. Um, I'm just sort of here because I, I like to talk, and um, I'm going to just sort of give an overview of Safe, and then they'll chime in with, with some things that come to mind. Um, and then we have James Katz and uh, Jesse Romo. James is from uh, Burns and McDonald, who's an organization that's done just amazing things with. Um, with FME and KML, and in many ways they continue to drive our KML. For sure, the organization that had more suggestions and um, requests for functionality addition on, on the whole KML Google Earth front is Burns and McDonald. We're very um, we're very thankful for that. Um, and we also have Jesse Romo, who's the uh, deputy director of airspace and special projects at the uh, the Kansas Department of Transportation, and uh, and together they're going to show off this amazing system that they've built. So thank you so much, James and Jesse, for taking the time to uh, to do this with us today. Okay, so questions are encouraged. Online we have um, Dan Eisminger, who's um, just ready, chomping at the bit, waiting for those questions. And uh, Mark Ireland, who is now in our Winnipeg office. All the way from Winnipeg. Yep, who is, is um, online as well. And uh, they're looking forward to uh, many questions. Um, and we'll answer them in real time as they can. And anything that they can't answer, we'll be sure to follow up with you with you later. And if we have time, a little question, question and answer at the end. That's right. Okay. So um, also um, stay tuned. We, um, we know there's um, usually there's 20% of people who attend these who have not, are not familiar with FME. And uh, so one way to get, um, get up to speed is there's, free, there's for some free seats for FME um, that's open to anybody who attends today. And um, we'll have a draw for that. And, um, or if you just simply want a refresher, um, it's online. And, um, and so uh, it's, it's a great way to get familiar with FME. Yeah, easy to attend. Yeah. Okay. okay. So first of all, some polls, I guess. The first one is on FME use. So uh, I'll launch the first poll here. So the first one is, how long have you used FME? Yes. Okay. And launch the poll. And um, this will only take a few seconds. So. Um, Everybody should see the poll, okay? And they're voting. They're voting. Oh, Excellent. Back and forth. Okay, good. So more than three years, one to three years, less than a year, or I do not use FME or the data interoperability extension. The reason we ask about the data interoperability extension is that is a uh, um, FME technology that's bundled under the Esri brand as part of the ArcGIS uh, product suite. It's an extra cost um, extension. So yeah. there you go. So we will close this poll and then we'll share the results in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And um, there you go. Um, you almost I, called it. I almost called it. 18%, 18 have not used FME. So we really appreciate your time. And um, we're not going to dive into gory details. More at the end of this, you're going to know what's, what's possible. We will show a few things, but um, okay. So on to the uh, hide the results. And then back to the one uh, more. We oh, want we have another, poll. Okay. another poll. We want to find out how you guys have used Google products or what particularly you have been using. Okay, there we go. So there's another poll. Okay, which Google products do you utilize in your work? Okay, so um, Google Earth, Google Fusion Tables, Google Maps, Google's, Google Map Engine, yeah. Google's, Google Maps Engine, formerly Earth Builder, I believe, right. and yeah. Google Spreadsheets. So uh, there we go. People are voting quickly. And uh, oh, looks like a bit of a tie there for Earth and Maps as it yeah. kind of go along. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. Okay, so we're going to close this poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and we'll share the results. And there you go. Uh, many use Google Earth, 90%. Pretty even there. Yeah, Google Maps and 82%. Well, that's good because we're going to show both of those today. Absolutely. And um, we do support uh, Google Fusion Tables and Google Spreadsheets as well. So yeah, very there good. we go. So we're going to hide those results now. 
Okay, and then back to back to the show. Back to the show. Okay. And I'm um, a little bit about Safe. Just one slide. Um, Safe. We're located in Vancouver. We call it the secret headquarters because actually we're in a suburb of Vancouver, uh, Surrey, BC. And um, and uh, we have we have about 95 people here. And um, we have a lot of fun. We work really hard, but we, we at Safe we look for people who are really excited and passionate about what what they do. And um, and uh, that's that's really all there is to us. We sell the tool worldwide, and we have. Um, you know, our, our own product, we probably have 8,000 people out there using it who have paid. And then we have, um, within the Esri um, data interop, there's, you know, tens of thousands of others. And our technology is embedded in many other products from Intergraph, MapInfo, Autodesk, etc. Okay, so that's a, all you need to know about us. Okay, um, what do we do? Um, essentially, we move data, all we kinds do. of data. And that's what you're going to see this morning, moving data from wherever it is into Google Earth, into Google Maps. Okay. And um, what kind of data? Well, all kinds of data. So you can see anything that's spatial or non-spatial, we can move it. So um, we grew up focusing on spatial, but of course, if you don't move the non-spatial data, you have pretty pictures with no, um, no, attributes. no, no attributes and no meaning. And, um, and then there's XML, and um, I love XML. It's great. Yeah, and we're going to see some really cool We're going to see stuff. some XML, exactly. Yeah, and exactly. XML, yeah. And the, yeah, so that's what we do. Um, all this, uh, the nice thing is, is all that you don't have to write code. So all this is done through a nice graphical authoring, whoa, authoring environment. And um, we also support real-time data. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and that's new with, um, with FME um, technology. And protocols and yeah. formats and sensors, mobile devices, pushing, pulling subscriptions and notifications. So that's um, something else we do. Are we going to see any of this kind of stuff? We are going to see the, the we're, we're going to see the sensors coming in from the buses and stuff. That's right, the yeah. dashboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So, okay. So now a question about you again. Okay. Yeah. We will go over and launch it. Well, we're getting through the polls here pretty quickly. Is this what are you interested in? Yeah. This is. Uh, let's see. There's two of them. What are you interested in? Okay. And there's going to be a follow up. What are you interested in? So because we got okay. more than four choices. What are you interested in? Oh, I see. So we'll go here. And this is a multi-choice one, so um, just uh, you know, so pick what, all the things you're interested in, and um, or just don't select the things you're not interested in. Yeah, you might be interested in everything. Wow, it looks like um, yeah, basically on the KML front, um, it's pretty. People are a lot of it adds up to more than 100 percent. Let me say that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to shut it down in five, four, three, two, one. Closing the poll. Okay, share the results, and there you go. So Filing is the biggest thing, no yep. surprise there. Mashups, no surprise there. Bringing multiple data sets together to show them on um, on Google Earth Maps, etc. And uh, great. Okay, so I'll hide those results, and then I guess I have what also are you interested in? Yeah, that's right, and that's kind of the second part of the question. Okay, launch poll, and this one has. Um, Live feeds. So, are you interested in showing live feeds, live data feeds? That goes back to that real-time slide Absolutely. we talked about. Um, viewing 3D data, we can do that too. That's that right. was one of the bubbles there. Web map tiling. Um, I think we're going to see that too. We're going to see that. We're going to see all and static maps. So, all four of these we will. Okay. See. So, I'm going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Close and share the results, and you'll see a, a pretty even split there. Wow. So that's, that's good. good. We're going to hit all these topics. We're going to hit all these topics, so hide the results. And now back over to here. And now I'm going to hand it over to Aaron, and I will be the color man, I guess. Okay. And you're going to start off showing us the live dashboard. So if I, so if people see the URL there, see it there. if they clicked on it when they get this slide deck, would they be able to view this? Absolutely. The Perfect. Same experience I'm going to go through right now. Okay. So I'm going to click here. Uh, can you open it? Yes, you can. I'm going to open that. And this is a, a spatial dashboard, which really means we're going to show some information uh, that's updated regularly. And I'm going to click on this link. This is our FMEpedia site. It was just that, so you can go and you can do that yourself. What we're showing here are live locations of ships, buses, and airplanes also. Now, the way this information comes in is in different, uh, different formats. The, uh, the, the ships in, in, uh, particularly come in uh, as a TCP stream, something okay. we're starting to call event stream. Mm -hmm. So FME is able to accept these continuous event streams right. um, because the, the ships 
pass their locations out at a regular, uh, at regular right. or irregular right. occurrence. Right. We've got to be ready for them. Right. So we have two ways of accepting events. We have the, this direct streaming mode in which basically we lock on and the TCP IP and as the data flows in we do it. And another one is just sort of periodic events that might happen. Yes. And that, and yeah. Okay. And the periodic events is more of a poll and that's what we're doing at the bus. It's basically there's some XML, uh, a feed up there and we're going and grabbing from that service. I'll be showing more of that one later. Uh, and the airplanes, same thing. We go out and grab, in that case, JSON, in the bus case, XML. I actually saw the buses move. Did you see the move? Mm -hmm. That's good because I, they, the next one, the next demo needs them to move. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think we'll move on now. So, so to be clear, that's a live feed. These are all, all three of these are live feeds. Yeah. So if I was in San Francisco at the right intersection, I could verify that on my device. Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yeah. You bet. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay. So we'll go to back to the presentation. Go on to the next one. Uh, so here's just a summary of what we were talking about. Source data can be TCP/IP, XML, JSON. And actually, the destination here is WebSockets. I didn't mention. So that's that. HTML5 WebSockets. HTML5 WebSockets. Okay. okay. Yeah, we're going straight from FME. Yeah. Straight out to the the web page, and then displaying on Google Maps. Mm -hmm. That demo, you can download it right from that FME PD page. All the workspaces and everything. Workspaces and everything. Okay. Right there. The next thing I want to show is styling and mashing up of data, but pr particularly the styling. Um, let me pull that up. And this one you built right for this demo, this, this webinar, so it's not yet publicly available. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, but it will be. But it will be. So here's the XML that you, we can hit. That's that service that yeah. every time we hit it. This is, I mean, look at this. This is why I love XML. It's beautiful. It's, it's human readable. It's human readable. It's, I think my dog could actually be trained to read this. I think it could be. Uh, <laughs> in here we've got the latitude, the longitude. Pay attention. We've also got the heading and the speed here. We're going to use both of those okay. columns in our example. But let's see what it looks like. Uh, when we convert it to KML. Okay. So here we're going to go into the FME server web interface here, and we're going to run the KML network link service. So that gives us a link that will refresh and get us the most recent data from that uh, service. Right. Here we go. It's going to refresh once to grab the initial data. Right. And once it's done that, be able to zoom into it. It doesn't normally take this long. It doesn't normally take this long. Let's see. We're on local host. Things are looking okay. They should have been looking okay. We can always fall back to the old static example. But this, what this should do is it should go out to FME server and say, give me the latest XML. But since it's uh, being temperamental for us, we'll open up. It worked like two minutes ago. Two minutes ago it worked. Yeah, perfect. That's how demos go sometimes. Especially when it's under development. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, here, are, here are basically the, um, the buses in green and red. So the red is the bus that stops. The green has, is actually an arrow showing not only the direction but the orientation. So we can mm -hmm. use that field to, uh, mm -hmm. to tilt the arrow. And I'm just going to quickly show the workspace just to walk you through that because it's it's not too complicated, actually, to do something like this. Does it have to, less than 15 transformers? You oh, it, it does. does. It has yep. six. I'll go full screen, and then I'll zoom full. We're reading in the XML. We're uh, turning those lat long into an actual geometry, a point. Yeah. We're testing to see if the bus is uh, going faster than zero. If right. it is, then we're going to give it an arrow. If it isn't, then we're going to style it with, I'll just show you quickly, a red stop sign, as you right. saw on there. Yep. We're giving the, the, uh, the, the feature an ID. Yeah. And then this is where we set the actual orientation so the arrow turns the right way. Yeah. yeah. So pretty simple. Not, not too hard. Mm -hmm. This will be available, as Don's saying, on FMEpedia. So, and, and actually, it will be the download from the webinars page. Perfect. So it will be included there. Okay. Okay, back to the presentation. We'll keep going. Uh, view data on Google Maps. So, I uh, want to show you, we've, we've saw the, the, the data on Google Maps. Here I want to show you how easy it is to uh, see KML and work with KML on a Google Map. So, let me get to that shortcut. And this is, you're also going to show us the, um, the, the, the um, playground, the FME server yeah. playground, which is a great, uh, great resource, really. Yeah. It's like a, a code playground. Yeah. FMEpedia again. Simply click Run FME Server Playground. Now we see all this JavaScript code that yep. we can use to 
as, a, as you see here, stream KML to Google Maps. So here's a, a workspace has provided this information and we've displayed it as a layer. There's the FME server URL that's being displayed there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's all this Google Maps does is it goes out, grabs the KML, brings it back, puts it on the map. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now I want to show you something really cool actually. I want to put, could you like change the size of that map? I could change the size of the map. It's kind of small. So we can change that to say 800 and maybe 400. There we go. And then you can hit refresh output. There you so go. You that's can, better. So I can see that better. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. You're welcome. No problem. And I mean, you can code right in here and then play. And then if I wanted to put that in my own browser or whatever, I can just grab that code, put it in, and away I go. Control A, copy, yeah. paste. And yeah. you're totally allowed to do that. We're not restricting that. Yeah. Or if you, maybe if you want to add a layer in here just yeah. to try it out. Oh, okay. We've got here, I've got a tile layer. So okay. this is the definition of a tile layer. You right. can see it goes out and it grabs some tiles that we created. Uh, there's the FME that it's calling. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's calling a workspace there. Uh, it's not calling a workspace, but we made the tiles with the workspace. Ah, that's right. Yeah. So we can make... So we ran... So, so basically, you don't even need FME server for this. You could have an FME desktop that ran, produced the tiles, and then you could just put your URL to your server there, and now you have a what you're going to see here. Absolutely. So all I do is I, I right-click, I paste that tile layer in there, and then I hit refresh output. And now you got to zoom in. I see them right by the 90. There it is. There it is. You didn't see them before because they weren't there. And as I zoom in, this is a pyramided uh, uh, cache or tile cache. Raster cache. Raster cache. And as we zoom in, we see a different level of detail. So you have to mean, so how many transformers to do that? To do that is maybe four, yeah. I think, something like that. Something called the map tiler, right? Map tiler. Yeah. And, yeah, and it does not only Google tiles, but also Bing. W M W M T M S or M T M S yeah web mapping tiling specification W M T S okay I always get those mixed up so do I have to say it I say W M S T no nope, that's not it either okay so this is the the, the playground feel free to go in there and try it out um, it's just a tool to help you guys out okay so we're gonna keep going here the next so that was kind of a mashup because I had my, my own tile set. Totally I was right. able to rasterize it and then put it in Google Earth. And of course, with FME, we could have also taken our vectors, converted those to rasters, then generated that as a raster map, and then see that in the back if we wanted to. Yeah. Not in this web webinar. And the, and the workspace is right there to generate the yeah. tile. Yeah, and we're, we're going to get all this. Perfect. Get all, all of it. Yeah. And even one to do, oh, this, there's a few extra ones there, too. Okay. Okay. So the, this is the last demo I'm going to show. It's Kind of a, our late, one of our latest, I would say. Yeah. Emailing Google static maps. So static maps are basically little maps that you can tell it, I want this location, this zoom level. And now for 2013, you'll be able yeah. to put the, the boundary right on there. That's right, because we support the, the polyline encoding now um, exactly. for Google Maps. And, so, and then it decides the zoom layers and all that stuff based on the extent of what your, um, you, you've, the poly, your polygon you've created. So yeah, it's a really cool feature. Nice little. Uh, oh, it should be working now. He's saying. Uh, oh no, you're right. This has got to go to a different server. Thank you very much. Let's quickly change this URL. Yeah. I believe that's what we want right there. Okay, it looks the same. Good. Yeah. So this is a just again. This is another one under development. That's right. That's okay. right. <laughs> Hot off the presses. We don't like to to wait too long. We get to pick where we want to. Uh, it's a so you're, so you're picking yeah. a park name. Yeah, we're saying I want to view. Um, a and what city map. are these in? These are in Interopolis. Okay. All so, which it looks a lot like Austin. It looks like Austin, Texas, but it's, it's just a little bit more quirky. Yeah. And and and. And they have quirky. and Interopolis hasn't decided on a single data format. Where oh, Austin no. has. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's like a parallel universe. Oh, and now it asks for security because you can always put security on. Right, or so. take it off if you like. Mm -hmm. This is FME server asking us. We yep. go in and okay, it says it succeeded. Now, right. what did it do? It, it, well, you entered your email. I'm betting if you go to your email, we, there's only one way to know. That's for sure. So here we go into the email, and as long as Google has not gone down, we're <laughs> good. Stranger things have happened in the middle of a demo. That well, that's for sure. There we go. Okay. Yep. Um, there we go. And boom. I got two because I set it up. Okay, so and I click view. Yeah, I'm going to click right on that. Look at that. There's and that the is the boundary around Morris Williams Golf Course. Perfect. That's right. We sent that to Google, and Google yep. said, cool, we're going to make a map and send it back yep. to you. Yeah, and then FME generated the, uh, the email. Yeah. Yep. 
yeah, that's it. So that's uh, that's that demo. Um, I think probably that's that's it. Any anything you wanted to add, Don? Before we no, I could, just on, on this last one. I mean, some of the ways we've used these static maps is in you know when when we're pushing event notifications because you can circle, you can put a polyline around the area of interest, or put a point, or or even put a line. You know, if you wanted to send somebody a notification with the route they should take. Yeah, lots of things you can do with that. So very, very powerful. Yeah, especially and everybody can open email. That's the nice thing about it. Exactly, and and when you get a notification, just having that extra context yeah. is really huge. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Okay, so that's the the end of my uh, my bits, and now we're gonna start to oh, I say we've got some pop ups. I'll have to get rid of those. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna turn this over to James and Jesse, uh, and they're gonna walk us through and show us a nice. Uh, Demonstration of the Kansas Airspace Awareness Tool. So, okay, so I've I will seen make before, um, so quite impressive. Very impressive. So I'm going to make them the um, the presenter. Yeah, make James. Yeah, that would be James the presenter. There we go. Okay. Okay. Are you there, James? We're here. Perfect. Okay. Well, this is Jesse Romo. I'm in the KDOT Division of Aviation, and we're going to talk to you. Uh, Appreciate that introduction about our airspace awareness tool. And actually, more than a tool, we created an airspace protection program. We like to call it Aeris Vigilis, which is Latin for airspace guardian. Next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh -oh. Sorry, we're having tough technical difficulties with our PowerPoint. And Okay, we'll talk a little bit about Kansas airports. We can go to the next slide. There are approximately 138 public use airports in the state of Kansas. I say approximately because at any time we have airports that close and we have others that open, but uh, we average right about 138. 80 of those airports, <clears throat> excuse me, are federally funded through the FAA Airport Improvement Program. Uh, with that program, they also sign off on several grant assurances. You know, back in 1946 when the um, First Aviation Act was passed, there were only eight grant assurances. Now there are 32 pages of them. Uh, Kansas airports combined received over $40 million in, in federal funds each year, and we have an airport improvement program from the state that's going from $3 million to $5 million a year. In aggregate, those airports in, in the state account for over $10 billion in on-airport economic impact. So why do I bring these things up? Because there is significant public investment and they have tremendous output. And why do we care so much about it? Well, we don't just look at each airport individually. We look at our airports as a system. So we have a Kansas airport system uh, plan and we have different measures in place. One of the measures that we have that we really focus on is air ambulance service, providing critical services to especially rural counties and areas in Kansas. And as you can see, we have 90% of the population should be within 30 minutes of an airport with an instrument approach, and 90% of the population should be within 30 minutes of an airport able to serve air ambulance operators. And the instrument approach procedures are really critical for us when there's bad weather, because um, before this map, you know, where all that blue shading was, the old saying was, don't have a car accident on I-70 in western Kansas on a bad weather day because you weren't going to get an air ambulance provider in there. But now we have really good coverage across the state. And as we look at the next slide, the, um, the map there on the right is all the proposed and existing wind projects in Kansas. That was as of August. Uh, that's a moving target. And you can see by the, the uh, green triangles, those are all the uh, wind farms that are operating. The blue are under construction, the red proposed. There are a lot more proposed than that, I guarantee you. And if you think back to the other slide that we have, go to the previous slide again, that's a lot of airports spread across the state. That's a lot of airspace that we're trying to protect. And as we look at the wind uh, farms and the locations, we can see that there's a potential for some conflict. And really, we don't want to have, um, the, we don't come from the point of view that we're against wind farms or green energy development, not at all. What we want to do is we want to partner with the developers to have a good location for them where they're perhaps juxtaposed the airspace but not penetrating it, causing the adverse impact. So we can look at airspace uh, protection and economic development working in concert. So how do we used to do it? 
the FAA still utilizes postcards for um, any interested party in uh, obstruction evaluations. So if you look at this uh, postcard closely, uh, this just came in on October 1st. There's an American cross in Ashland that wants to be erected at 1,027 feet above ground level. That's a pretty big cross. I think uh, they're going for the record there. We get all sorts of airspace cases that we have to look at. And you know, uh, a few years back, we averaged about 200 cases per year. Now we're averaging well over 2,000. So there's been an exponential increase in how many airspace cases come through our state, most of which are directly related to wind turbines. Um, the FAA has adopted a, an electronic notification system, so we do get emails, but it's not an absolute process. Uh, the emails that come through look exactly like this. I want you to remember this format. You know, we have the uh, case numbers, whether or not it's circularized for public comment, it's a determined case, uh, what city it's related to, and the lat longs. What we end up doing for our tool is cut and pasting this uh, format into an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll show you that in a minute. Now, when you look at the cases, <clears throat> the FAA will evaluate cases from a perspective of pilot safety, not airport utility. And the FAA issues determinations of hazard and no hazard that um, will let you know if you're going to have adverse or significant impacts to instrument approach procedures. And we are allowed to comment on each of these cases. One of the challenges we had was the FAA would provide two maps to us to evaluate the airspace. One is a topographical map, and if it looks a little washed out on this screen, um, it looks washed out to us too. And I've never really dealt much with topographical maps. I have a hard time reading them. And so I look at an aeronautical chart. I'm a pilot. These look much more familiar, so I start getting a little bit more comfortable at it with an aeronautical chart. But there's some challenges with it. You know, an aeronautical chart will give you, like this one here, Garden City Regional Airport. It gives you a little icon there showing you where the airport is. Well, that's not an exact location of where the airport actually resides. It is just a general depiction of where the airport is. And how do we figure that one out? We looked at Google Earth, and I circled the airport there, highlighted the runways. And what we want to do is overlay the airspace, uh, excuse me, the aeronautical chart, and we can clearly see that the runways don't match up with the icon. So when you think back to the little maps that we used to get from the FAA, that we still get, we had a case in Garden City where uh, there was an obstruction that was going to be erected south of the airport. And from looking at the aeronautical chart, it looked like it was right on runway center line. And we objected to it. Well, the FAA came back and said, you have no basis for objecting. It is not in any airspace. It's parallel to one of the runways even. And we said, but it looks like it's off the runway end. And this is why, because we were looking at the wrong map. We didn't have a good visualization of what that obstruction was going to do with that airport. So we really needed a better look at airspace. And we asked the question, why not? Why not use something like Google Earth that's available to the public, that's easy to use, and then have data layer options where we can load up um, airport data or we can load up airspace data, look at it in um, not just two-dimensional drawings of the Part 77 surfaces, but also the three-dimensional drawings. And why not be able to add obstructions to uh, right on top of that, draw a little avatar so we can see the wind turbine in relation to the airspace. Now, I drew this one out there, and it's a little exaggerated, as you can see uh, from the data there. It's 8,000 feet tall. Uh, luckily, we don't have wind turbines reaching 8,000 feet. We do have them anywhere up to uh, over 600 feet. So this is why we do it. Airports are a critical public infrastructure, uh, heavy public investment, tremendous economic output, but they also provide air ambulance service, which is especially important for our rural counties. And there's a real safety aspect to it. And one of the reasons, or one of the ways that we explain this to communities, because not all of us are you know, aviation um, professionals here, if you have uh, two roads, which is going to be the road less traveled? If you have a forest and you're trying to design a roadway and you can take the road around the contours uh, of the earth, go around the existing, um, existing tree lines, as you see on the left-hand side, or you take out the, some of the trees, make a parallel with the uh, roadway, have a straight you know, line A to B. If you ask an engineer, is this a safe road, and you look at the one on the left, the engineer will tell you yes. 
is designed properly. It's got good pavement. Uh, as long as you, you only go 25, 30 miles an hour, you're going to be safe on this road. No problem to travel it. But if you ask the community, well, which one do you want to use? Well, I want to get there a lot faster. I want the straight line. I want 65, 70, 75 miles per hour. It's the same thing with instrument approach procedures. We have different kinds of uh, procedures that uh, we can fly into an airport. Now, uh, we look at minimums for instrument approach procedures, and cloud bases are never just you know, a solid layer. You have them at different levels. And the line on the bottom, we have uh, approaches that will go to, at a 30, 41, a 41 uh, ratio, or you have these step-down procedures that are, you know, you fly to certain points, you go down a certain altitude, make a turn, make a turn, go to this point, now you can descend. By the time you break out of the clouds, you're almost right on top of the airport. Now, what happens when we allow different obstructions to be erected near that airspace? Well, essentially, we make that uh, one precision approach where you break out a lot further unavailable. And so now the only available instrument approach procedure is the other one with the step downs, the ones that break you out where you have to have higher cloud um, levels, where you have to break out right over the airport. And when you ask air ambulance operators, well, which one would you rather, which one would you rather fly? It's like asking the drivers, which one would you rather have, the long, windy road or the straight and narrow? And so this is how we look at instrument approach procedures. We want to make sure that we can work in concert with the developers and have uh, good approaches, maybe shift those obstructions a little bit more so we don't have such an impact to them. And this is where the airspace awareness tool has really come in and played a critical role in helping us educate uh, our communities across the state in understanding airspace, the issues, and this is what it looks like. And as you can see from the left-hand side, we have several different data layers. Now, all those data layers come from the FAA. And as you can imagine, uh, each, even though it's coming from the FAA, they came from different databases, so they're all in different formats. And I don't know if Jamie wants to talk a little bit about the challenges that we had with uh, collecting that data. Sure, guys. So um, Jesse just gave us a lot of information, which I think is good to give us an overarching perspective on what this tool was supposed to do. Challenging aspect was figuring out a way to actually make that happen with something technical. As you guys can see, this is a web page that everybody has access to. If you want to go out to this web page, you can hit it through the Aviation KDOT website. And we created a URL that was easy to remember as well. It's www.ksdot.org slash airspace tool. And that's one word, and it'll take you direct, directly to this link. Okay, so as Jesse was mentioning, they wanted a tool that would allow them to plot the locations of those potential impedances to the airspace. So the first thing that we had to do was create the airspace, and um, he went through it briefly, but all of these transitional surfaces have different ratios. Um, right here we have a 40 to 1, and then it transitions into a 51. We have a conical surface that surrounds it, so there's a very complicated 3D model that needs to be created from this. Additionally, if I zoom out here, we had to do it for the entire state. Go back down. And we needed to make it interactive enough that the user would be able to drop their own location. And I'm going to drop one right now. So let's say we want to add a structure. And 200 is a pretty good one. 500, we're going to do a 500, okay? And we can do a windmill or we can do some other type of obstruction. Go with a windmill. We'll plop it right there. And there you have it. You can see that we've just dropped this guy down. And for some reason, my, I've lost control of my 3Ds. Well, anyway, you can see um, that we've dropped the obstruction into the transition surface. And this is what a developer would actually go through the process. You now click on it. it. Gives you the lat long coordinates, the structure height, and the airport ID that it's closest to. So it's grabbed all of that attribute information from this bounding box. And then if you want to, you can click on this to go to the FAA Notice Criteria Tool, which is another um, tool that the FAA provides. And we'll just try it. And this will give us the actual submittal, so it actually put it into the lat long that I gave it, um, the correct datum, site elevation, structure height, 
and then you can submit it if you need to. And as you can see this result right here, it says you exceed the following notice criteria. And this will actually actually give you the FAA criteria that you have not that you've actually exceeded. And as a developer, you could submit it. And do you want to talk about just, this a little bit? If you just scroll down just a little bit, it'll tell you that the FAA requests you to file. And you can see the lovely diagram that they provide. And one of the issues that we've had is um, with lat longs, they come in all different formats. You've got the degree minute seconds, you've got decimals. And uh, when we were trying to look at the notice criteria tool in the past, we had a hard time visualizing whether or not we had the correct lat long. Uh, location just based off of the, the drawing that they provide. So we're going to go back out to our tool. One of the other things that Jesse was mentioning was they received notifications from the FAA um, via an email. And so we've created a tool that allows you to add those data attributes that the FAA sends to you. Here. Jesse right now um, behind the scenes is trying to grab the email. You might want to minimize that. I just turned it. There you go. Okay. Right. You want to grab the whole thing? Okay, I'll let Jamie uh, talk while I Jamie grab that there. He showed you how to um, plot a single wind turbine there, and one of the issues that we've had is uh, we get notification for wind turbines, wind farms that um, tens, twenties, thirties. I mean, the, the the number of wind turbines that we have to look at is just tremendous. So, like I mentioned before, that email that we had in that format, all we ended up doing was plotting it into an Excel spreadsheet. We added one column for the height, and then we're able to come into here to the data batch entry and just import the data. And it'll take us right to the location. This one, in particular, uh, was a challenge to us because it was um, filed under the city name of Altair. Now, Altair is a city name that hadn't been used since the mid 1800s. There's a little spot that uh, the trains on the railroad tracks they they, they stop there. It's like a little watering hole. Anyway, so. Uh, the town is actually Colby, is where it, it would be impact management approach procedures. And this gave us an immediate view of, um, of where, where it was. So we want to show them to some of the uh, wind farms that are currently uh, existing. We have the option to zoom into them. You want to go to a particular one? Uh, we can look at um, Ellsworth, for instance. Or Leota, <laughs> sorry. And we were able to load up all the uh, the existing wind farms, um, and then draw little avatars. And if you zoom in, you can see that the, there is the shadow of the structure, and where we drew the avatar is really close to where it actually exists. So it gives us a really good indication of where uh, the wind farms are in the state currently. I think. Um, do we need to? You want to talk to me? more about the tool itself or do you want to jump out and uh, maybe I can show a little bit of the translation. So yeah, let's look at the Let's look at the, it yeah, how it for works. the complexity that we've kind of that would be here. That would be good. All right. Oh, sorry guys. I gotta log in. So as you can see, um, one of the the requirements that State of Kansas had was an easy mechanism to create this. Um, I know how familiar we are with FME translations. You guys have all seen some, some simple examples that Don and those guys have showed you. But what we have here is a very complex translation. We have multiple custom transformers that are actually taking a spreadsheet that Jesse provides with just the runway coordinates which is this file right here, and I'll zoom in. This would be my input file, and I've converted it to a CSV, but this is the actually the only thing that KDOT has to update, and maybe show you some of the attributes. Just some runway information. This is an Excel spreadsheet, but it could be a database or whatnot. And then 
They simply have to run this tool. It creates a KML, and the output becomes what you guys were seeing here, which is the airspace itself. And similarly, we do the kind of the same thing with uh, the obstruction tables that are received from the FAA. And I guess that's kind of a, from my perspective, probably enough. What do you think? Okay. So I don't know if we've lost everybody because we can't hear what's going on. Nope, we're, everybody's still here. Yep. Okay, good. So do you guys want to take control? Because I think we're kind of done with our presentation at this point. Okay, great. Wow. Is um, If I had to summarize that in one word, um, just amazing to see what, uh, what you guys have done with um, Google Earth being able to take advantage of, of the 3D capabilities of that. And, um, and, and, and just so folks know all that, you know, all the 3D stuff and, and um, all that stuff was done with FME as, as they were just showing that workspace there. So we're going to go back now. So Aaron's going to take back the console. So thanks so much for that, uh, guys. That's great. So here we go. So I think we're probably getting ready to wrap up here. Yep. Yeah. So, so yeah, so we are going to, th this webinar was recorded and um, we'll put it on, on our website. We'll also put it on FME channel. Um, over the next while, what we'll do is we'll break it up into, into short segments so that if you're, you know, you wanted to see what Kansas City has done with Burns and McDonald, um, then, um, then great. You, you can look at that or if you want to see any of the demos that Aaron's done. Um, you can do that as well. All the files um, and data we used are, are, that we used are also available. So they're great starting, starting points if you want to see something you liked and you want to uh, see how we did it um, and uh, get started that way. Of course, also ask us tons of questions. If you get anything and you want some assistance, that's what we're here for. I'd say if we always talk about the restaurant model. And, and when you go to a restaurant, the food has to be really good and the service has to be really good. Um, or, or you won't go back. And we've all been to restaurants where, you know, we'll say, how was the restaurant? Well, the food wasn't as good as it used to be, or the food was good, but the service was terrible. And, um, and really, either both of those are, are, you know, you have to have good food and good service to have a really good experience. And that's what, uh, what we focus on. And um, we also really rely on partners like Burns and McDonald to uh, help us make our product better. And, um, and so if you do use FME now and there's things that you would like us to do better, please, um, please let us know. So, yeah. Okay. Okay, so what's next? So you can always learn more about FME. Uh, you can get a free trial of FME Desktop or FME Server or both uh, if you like at uh, safe.com. Yeah. We do personalized web demos quite All often. The time. Yeah. Uh, invite uh, your staff together, ask us some questions, and then uh, or send us some questions. We'll, we'll prepare and give you a, a yeah. live web demo. That's right. I think we have four going on today, or three going on today, not counting this one. We we yeah. we've deployed the the That's right. ready basically. That's right. We like to use bandwidth. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and upcoming webinars just like this one, uh, yeah. you can go to safe.com, always see that. And training courses on November, I want to say 14th, don't quote me, there will be a KML training course. Okay. I'll be presenting that, so that's uh, quite relevant to this audience. So Excellent. Uh, ooh, here oh, we go. Okay, here we go. John, you want to whip us up a poll here? Absolutely. So this is the chance. Thanks for, uh, we saved this to the end because we know some of you come just to hear the, get the free training yeah, off. Yeah, we've heard that. That was that. a bad joke. That was no, a bad That joke. was bad, no. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could this be to win a seat in your course, Aaron? It is actually, to be quite honest, it is. It's sort of self promotional. That's, that's right. right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so in case you're wondering who that is, if we, um, that was Dale Lutz. He just joined us here. It was too exciting. I couldn't. That's right. That's right. He almost had a car accident. <laughs> he tried to go straight on one of those windy roads we just heard about. <laughs> yeah, you got to keep the speed down. Okay. So so people are voting here. Okay. And um, you'll see we have yes, yes, please. And no thanks, and uh, yes please is winning, so I expect yeah. some of the people voted yes. What do we do with the yes people? We, 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 really, we know they really meant yes please. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, so we're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, and uh, sure, we'll share the results. What the heck? There you go. Don't, don't want training. I would so there you that'd go. be probably the people who have been with us for that's you know, right. Two, that's three, right. That's right. Hopefully it wasn't the 18% who had never used FME before. Well, hope, <laughs> yeah, hope not. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot there for, for uh, saying uh, yes, and we'll get back to you uh, if, with the results. If, if, if one. Yeah, that's with right. The results.
Okay, we'll keep going. And question and answer. So yes, we, have, we do have some time for we that. We have some time. Okay. So I've got questions here, and let me pull them up. Okay. No, it is not going to be available on an 8-track tape. Yeah, that's right. Is that a question? There's these people asking, and they're worried that they don't have a player, uh, but that's not going to be an issue. What is an 8-track? Yeah. Oh, wow, well, that goes oh, to these boy. young guys. These young guys, yeah. They is were it, the greatest thing. Is that like a USB? Uh, no. Okay. It's better. And a very short technology cycle. That's right. It's related to beta, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm. Let's let's just go from the bottom here. And we got Dale in the room, which is good. Somebody's asking about BIM models, which is something I'm always interested in. Yeah. And so we can read IFC, and we're working hard to see if we can bring bring Revit into the family somehow. So the answer will be well, already is yes if you have IFC data yeah. or SketchUp data. And um, we're looking uh, in the next year to see if we can do a, at least a reasonable job reading Revit. Yeah. Somebody asked, can the map Tyler tool build pyramids for DEM data? And um, it, it, and of course, if the if the the, the DEM data is raster DEMs, then absolutely yes. So um, so and now that's a very interesting question, but uh, good one. Hmm. Well, is FME <laughs> server different than FME desktop? Um, yeah, all the um, all the workspaces are authored that you saw are authored on desktop. They can also be run on desktop. So in the case of the map Tyler, you in fact didn't even need FME server. You could have run that on the desktop. Um, and with desktop, you can also you know maybe have a cron job. You can batch things up and run them at night. So if you want to overlay map tiles on Google Earth or Google Maps, what you could do is um, simply have a desktop, batch it up, produce your tile set, and uh, away you would go. Uh, how does the workspace know which columns represent location? Um, basically, the the author knows. So, because of course the the, um, the the locations could be called anything, and so um, it's very simple. You just specify the columns in the 2D point replacer for your CSV file or Excel file or database file that that uh, table that isn't spatial, and uh, that's all there is to it. There's a question here: Do you need a license from Google to use the Google Static Maps? I think probably if you're going production, it'd be wise to check into it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm not aware. For demo purposes, you'd be fine because there's a limit. But uh, yeah, if you're gonna if you're gonna go go production, then then you would contact Google and there is there is some licensing. They rest otherwise they restrict you for the number of maps you're allowed to produce. Oh, per, okay. Okay. Over a period of time. We have a question on PLS CAD. Can FME convert PLS CAD transmission line models? I believe we do some work with PLS. CAD. We don't have it as a natively supported format, but we, I, Mark Stokes has mentioned customers that have done stuff. I believe that there's a way. Don, you'd like this to get XML out of PLS CAD. Uh, oh, XML once again is the solution. Yes, that's right. And uh, so it has been done. We should ask Mark Stokes to chime in on the chat. Uh, but I believe that it, it can be done, but it's a little bit tricky. Yeah. So actually, certainly, if that person, we can get back in touch with that person. Yeah. Uh, or if any of the rest of you are interested in that, let us know. And we can maybe eventually do an FMEpedia article. There we go. There's a good question. Yeah. Excellent. Can server stream high density points to web viewers, say GE? And the answer is absolutely yes. Oh yeah. Again, the way we do that is with web sockets, and uh, you know we can follow up um, for to any of you who are interested in that, and we can provide you with the sample as well. Yeah. But that's really where this whole um, HTML5 web socket technology is key. That's an interesting one. We got another question about SharePoint. Um, we'll probably follow up. We hear about SharePoint all the time. Can FME, uh, in this case, read or write to a SharePoint? Oh, to SharePoint. And uh, you know, we'll follow up with you and, and add you to the the request from uh, that we have. Yeah. We have an yeah. existing request. And questions like that are great because then we can really understand exactly what you want to do, the APIs and and the documents you want to get. And then exactly. Uh, yeah. If we can understand the the most important thing, then we can help out. Yeah. That's an interesting one about elevation data. And we certainly have done all kinds of things with that yep. to make surface models and so on. Yep. I, I personally don't know if anybody's ever put it out to Google Earth, though. Do you know? Elevation data into a KML. Yeah, uh, we certainly we could. could. Yeah, we absolutely Nobody's could. Nobody's ever asked, I yeah, guess, because. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we absolutely could. We can use it as a as an attribute of, say, like a diagram. Yeah, show. we've had people even show dams being built exactly. in Google Earth. You know, and then you could see on a daily basis how the dam's being built up. We'd be overlaying a new surface yeah, there. Yeah, so we kind of was, yeah, but the, the flooding thing was doing something different. That was. A I mean, we make a tin which could give you a bunch of triangles. Yeah. And then those are three D triangles. We can put them out, and they yeah. would yeah. presumably float over the earth. Yeah. 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 Uh, so it sounds like we can do it. It's just a matter of, of what particular you want to do. Um, we have a question about VRML, 
And I think we're starting to work with VRML. Well, or, I don't think we read VRML. The person is asking, can we read a VRML and put it out to KML? And the answer would be no right now, yeah. as far as you know. Yeah. We can write it. Yeah. In fact, in FME 2013, there's a new VRML writer for those that mm -hmm. care mm -hmm. because we did an X3D writer. Yeah. But uh, we yeah. don't do a reader. Yeah. But it is XML, so we might be able it's to. It's XML, so, so we might be able, think could do. Yeah, we might be able to, to pull something out there. Okay. Uh, this question, uh, can we get the email address of the presenter developer? So we'll follow up and uh, make sure you can get that if, yep. if, if, the, if that's cool. So, yeah. Yep. Um, does Google Earth Maps sit inside FME Server? No, it, it's basically just a web page, uh, yep. as, uh, just like the Google Maps you use from Google. Actually, somebody, uh, you know, if they're concerned about the licensing, one, one other thing to consider is possibly those map box guides. Yeah. Yeah. The open street map styling and that, we might want to look into some demos involving that. We were just talking about that. You were? Yeah. Okay, yeah. there you go. Yeah. So it's an alternative web mapping framework. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really nice maps. What type of web services serve XML feeds? It's our data streaming service. R right? R R. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and and, um, and the buses. What was that? Was XML, wasn't it? Yeah, and what, that was by Next Space, I think. Or yeah. Next Bus. And what was the protocol? The protocol was HTTP. HTTP. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so there are they are out there. In general, feeds um, so stream the data in two formats. By and large, the number one would be JSON, and we yeah. read that just as well as we yeah. read XML. And the second popular would be XML. Yes. And the third one, there still are some out there that used to CSV or or column aligned text. Yeah. Um, and um, the days and, are numbered on those. And um, and we read all those. So the for the the, the um the format really is hasn't been the issue at this point, unless of course it's an, encry an encrypted um, stream. Actually, that's AIS. What kind of format? That's um, column aligned text. AIS is column aligned yeah. text. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's actually encrypted too. You can get yeah. it. Yeah. That's okay. encrypted. Anyways. Okay. Um, okay. Any we do it all. Bottom line is we do it oh, all. Oh yeah. A including PDF, which is a question. Any interfaces with PDF? We can certainly write PDF, and we've, we're starting to get demands to read PDF. So, you know, we'll follow up. I just yeah. saw some tweets uh, yeah. Yeah. this week from Laren Darby. I'm not sure if he's tuned in, but he was celebrating success in reading PDF with them. Know how he did it, not with FME. Oh, okay. And, uh, it proves it can be done. Okay. Uh, do you know much about this one here? H E C R A S file formats. Never heard. Never heard. Have we'll a look into up. it. Yeah. Um, do you have the Ability data. O data. Don, you're a big O data guy. Yeah, we do have um, some code around here that's been in beta for a while. So, so again, we'll follow up with you. Um, and um, and you know, if you have a stream, an O data stream, then then that's half the battle won for us. Okay. Uh, you want to jump in on any of these questions? Yeah. Um, can you validate topology against um, ST geometry? And um, we do have a new, in 2013, we, one of the areas we've really focused on is um, geometry validation. So, so there you go. So you could uh, make sure that your data. And the, the question about validating topology, there, we have a topology builder that That's can right. make sure that all the parts of a network are connected. It depends exactly what the question would mean. Yep. Um, we can also do comparisons. If you give me data from a database and data from a CAD file, I can tell you what stuff's in common and what isn't, yeah. that sort of thing. Oh, very interesting. Hey, do we do service work? What's our story there? Yeah, take, it, take it away. Yeah, I mean, I mean, by and large, what we try to do is more is train and um, and uh, you know knowledge transfer. We have a big um, SME professional services network out there of folks. Certified professionals. Certified professionals. Including Burns and McDonald. And Burns and McDonald is a great example of yeah. a partner of ours that yeah. does does the work. Now we do do some um, from time to time, but our core is to really to focus on on growing, help, you know, creating a, a business for folks like Burns and McDonald and and learn from from them as well. So, And thank you to Kyle, Gary, and Shannon. H-E-C-R-A-S, uh, it's a hydraulic modeling software. Uh, it's okay. like PLS CAT. All right. Okay. Um, what else do we want? We've got time for a couple more. What 3D formats have a time span animate component? Well, there's Google Earth, obviously. Um, I think ArcGIS has some ability in their geo database mm -hmm. to have time. Um, not sure of any others. We don't. Like, I think Collada can do that sort of oh, stuff, really? but we don't support that part. So that 3D and animation, I suppose, is an area of opportunity for us. Can you us display still. things such as a drill hole below the surface? Absolutely you can. And in fact, we've had um, oil and gas companies who have 
use our technology to show where their actual drill holes are and because they don't just go straight up and down, they actually go in weird angles and all that sort of thing. So it doesn't have to be above surface. I think if folks uh, go to our website and search or just go onto Google and search for FME, 3D, PDF and Shell, there was a newsletter article about how Shell ah, there made you go. 3D PDFs and the, and the main picture there has all these lines going down into the earth, sort of like a scene from War of the Worlds. Yeah, yeah. And somebody says, why is this solution specifically on Google? Um, our technology is, um, that was just this solution. Um, with any solution, they, you know, you typically pick a piece of uh, technology and use it. But of course, we're not just about Google. It could have been on ArcGIS. It could have been on, um, it could have been on open layers. Could have been on Bing Maps. Could have been on other things. Um, and um, as we just mentioned, another one is um, is a map box. So if there's other technology you'd like us to to do a demo on, let us know, and uh, we're happy to put together some demos that that show what uh, different formats and different systems can do. Yeah, I mean it's important to point out that FME is really format agnostic. Yeah. And having said that, we do know that some formats are more equal than others. Yeah. But still, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, the main work you do in FME, you don't you don't honestly care too much about format yeah. until you get to the end of the line. That's so obviously, right. for things like KML. There's amazing power in there yeah. that FME lets you get access to, yeah. and so um, anything that that has power, of course, we can pull the lever. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And just to clarify, there's a yeah. question: Can we create time-lapse animation for Google Earth? Yeah, and yeah. absolutely. And uh, if you go to the, if there's a URL. Um, the Mark um, Ireland, our evangelist. If you go yeah. to evangelism.safe.com, um, I don't know if you can open it. Is there a way, whoever uh, answered that one, can you just uh, send that answer out to everybody? Because yeah. if they do that, uh, send that link out to everybody and they can go and uh, That's right, that. that's right. But he writes, wrote a great article showing on exactly how you can do that in, uh, with Oh, FME. maybe Aaron can show it. Maybe. Okay, we're going to go visit Evangelism. I think it's evangelism.safe.com. Yeah, there's no, there's no FME on the front. Oh, okay. Ooh. I need to get a safe.com in there, my friend. <laughs> evangelism. That'll, get us, something, that'll right? get us something. It'll be interesting, I'm sure. <laughs> I think I think we have the URL FME Evangelist as well. Do we? Do we? Okay. Did yeah. you search for, like, um, oh, where was it? It's going to be back there. Yeah. So, anyway. It it's, anyways, go to this URL. Do a little search. You'll find it. What was it? What was he talking about again? Time spans. Time spans. You could probably click that link on that answer if we could get to it. But Yeah. Anyway. we got to wrap up. So, yeah. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. There it is. In there. Go so, check that out. Uh, so the last thing, basically, thank you. We'll be following up with an email, so uh, that'll have links and things like that. Yeah. And uh, to the webinar, yeah. and also there, there we go. Calls to action as yeah. ever. Yeah. If you want to talk about a trial or anything, you can go to safe.com or contact sales. If you just want to find out uh, about to what we can do, support's always accessible. And there's the link to that airspace awareness tool. Yeah, yeah. And we'll have the contact tool. information yeah. for, for the other folks too. We'll yeah. contact them and see how they would like to be contacted. And um, great. Well, thank you so much for your time. We know you've all got lots of things on the go. And um, we hope that you've found this hour with us to be worthwhile. And um, if it is, um, we invite you to all the others. And um, please also um, tell all your friends and business associates to come. If you found this hour to be a waste of time, uh, don't tell anybody else. Just, j just tell us. <laughs> we definitely want to know. Just tell us, and uh, we'll do our best to, to make it to make it better. So again, like a restaurant, a restaurant wants you to spread the word. If it's good, if it's bad, the restaurant wants you to complain to them, and that's sort of the way we are too. I think we should also thank our friends from Burns and Mac and uh, yeah, Kansas. Absolutely. Airspace. Yeah. What an amazing thing they've absolutely. accomplished, and uh, absolutely. it's always uh, almost humbling for us to see what people do. Yeah. And uh, they're they're by far the greatest evangelists, really, yeah. is people that do stuff like that. So thank you guys so much for being willing not only to do what you've done, but to share it with everybody like you did today. Yeah, it's fantastic. Thanks, guys. And with that, all right, thanks okay. so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah.